Peter B. Collins, News and Comment. It's Wednesday, May 17th, 2017. As the District of Columbia is awash in anonymous official leaks, the patriotic leaker who spent seven years at Leavenworth, Chelsea Manning, is a free woman. I'm issuing an official irony alert because the backdrop of Chelsea Manning's release is this flood of leaks in Washington. And you know that not a single one of these official leakers who have access to top-secret, highly classified information on a daily basis will face any punishment for what they are doing. Now, first to the Manning situation. Chelsea was released from Leavenworth early this morning, and her supporters announced that she was released safely. She had been sentenced to 35 years for leaking government files, and President Obama, to his credit, did commute most of the remainder of her sentence just before he left office in January. A statement from Chelsea? After another anxious four months of waiting, the day has finally arrived, she said. I'm looking forward to so much. Whatever is ahead of me is far more important than the past. I'm figuring things out right now, which is exciting, awkward, fun, and all new for me. So this is a great day. And on Twitter, Chelsea Manning, who now controls her own tweets, uh, she had a friend doing it for her while she was incarcerated, uh, she tweeted a picture of her legs and feet. <laughs> with the simple tweet, First Steps of Freedom. And according to her supporters, she is not going to announce exactly where she will be relocating. She has family in Maryland, but I believe she's estranged from her parents, so I, I don't know exactly what her transition uh, back to freedom will be. And, of course, she has an incomplete transition from male to female. I still proudly have a free Bradley Manning sticker on one of my computers. So this is an important day, and I really celebrate the release of Chelsea Manning. But as I opened, the official leakers, for example, everyone is agog that yesterday the New York Times had a report of an alleged memo written by James Comey now, we have to re remind you that this is based on a leak. We haven't seen this memo. Portions of it were read over the phone to New York Times reporter Michael Schmidt, and he based his story on that. Now, it's probable true, probably true, and we expect to see these Comey memos in short order. But I just need to remind you that the little firestorm that broke yesterday is once again based on leaks, anonymous sources, and uh, zero evidence available to the public. And it is interesting how Donald Trump chose to make his approach to the FBI director. This is back in mid-February, the day after Michael Flynn was forced to resign. And after a meeting in the Oval Office that included other people, Trump asked Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, who is supposed to have recused himself from all of these issues, and uh, also Vice President Pence, to leave the Oval Office and left Comey alone with Trump. This is described as very rare that they would have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And so in their conversation, it's important to note that what Trump first said was, I think we've got to crack down on all of these leaks, and he condemned those leaks and suggested that Comey and the FBI should consider putting reporters in prison for publishing classified information. Now, that got buried in the story, and I'm going to return to that in a moment because I think it's extremely important. But what he is quoted as saying, again, this is hearsay from a, a purported memo and again, I believe it does exist, but since we haven't seen it, we can't treat that as evidence. We can't treat that as proof. And somebody who is associated with James Comey, maybe at the FBI, maybe outside, read portions of this memo to the reporter. 
And we get a quote of Trump to Comey. I hope you can see your where I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go, to letting Flynn go. He is a good guy. I hope you can let this go. And according to Comey's notes, again, leaked via a phone call, <laughs> we're told that his only reply was, well, I agree he's a good guy. Now, <clears throat> the way this is phrased by Trump is important. And on CNN yesterday, I saw the graphic on screen describing how Trump on CNN asked Comey to close the case against his friend Mike Flynn. And on MSNBC, the graphic said that Trump had ordered Comey to do that. And he didn't actually do either because his phrasing, whether it was clever or, you know, Trump is a, an extortionist with experience, I think that is a highly likely, the way he phrased it was not quite a criminal act, in my opinion, because it's not a request, it's not a demand, it's uh, aspirational. I hope that you do this. And, of course, this follows the dinner that Trump had with Comey a few weeks before that, when Comey declined his offer to express his loyalty to the Trumpster. So, then the White House issued a statement which is technically true, based on the representations of the New York Times report. Quote, While the president has repeatedly expressed his view that General Flynn is a decent man who served and protected our country, the president has never asked Mr. Comey or anyone else to end any investigation, including any investigation involving General Flynn. He just mused about it. <laughs> Did he cross a line? Well, in terms of a criminal act, I think probably not. It's right up to the edge. But as we'll discuss in a moment, it does t appear to meet standards of an impeachable offense. And so the media firestorm is largely warranted here. But once again, it is based on a spark that we can't see. And this is what's maddening about this whole cycle of leaks that goes all the way back to last summer. We don't have any evidence that Russia hacked the DNC. We don't have any evidence yet that's been made public about the exact conversations that Mike Flynn had with the Russian ambassador Sergei Kislyak and whether he in fact discussed sanction relief, as has been posited by media reports based on, you, get, you guessed it, leaked anonymous commentary. And of course, this is compounded by the president's Twitter threat last Friday, where he said James Comey better hope that there are no tapes of our conversations before he starts leaking to the press. And I think that's a bit of a challenge to a guy like Comey. And so by releasing what we're told are contemporaneous notes that he made just after the conversation with Trump, and he has memos like this on every conversation he's had with Trump, I'd say the advantage is to Comey. Now, <laughs> this creates even further problems because, of course, we have uh, Jason Chaffetz, who has been reluctant to use his power as the chair of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to pursue anything related to any Republican. But yesterday, uh, even before the day was out, Based on the Times reporting, Jason Chaffetz pounced, and he wrote a letter to the acting director of the FBI, Andrew McCabe, demanding copies of the memoranda. There are expected to be similar requests to the White House demanding any tape recordings that were made of Trump-Comey conversations. And, of course, based on what little we know about Trump's threat, he could have had a little digital recorder in the chair that Comey was sitting in and not have the kind of uh, uh, installed wiretapping system that famously brought Richard Nixon down in the Watergate case, which famously gave Peter B. Collins a, a big boost in his radio career back in the 1970s. But this Chaffetz memo uh, letter is, is pretty powerful, and it includes uh, four pages of uh, rules about uh, how these documents, uh, what the request is based on, how they should be supplied to the committee, and gave them essentially a one-week deadline. 
So, if the FBI cooperates and the memos as represented in the New York Times exist, we should see them very, very soon. And yesterday we saw this lead to real hand-wringing by Republicans who so far have just deflected and spun up the antics of Donald Trump, his repeated lies, even those that contradict his own previous lies, and the leader of the, what I could say, constitutionalist wing of the Republican Party of the House is a fairly young, I think he's in his second or third term, Tea Party Republican from Michigan, Justin Amash. And he's one of the few Republicans who I have partially praised in the past because he has stood up for our Fourth Amendment rights and has fought hard against domestic surveillance by the NSA. Now, I don't agree with Justin Amash on many other issues, but this is what we need to see. This is a harbinger. This is the canary in the coal mine that will give cover to other Republicans who say, you know what, Trump is too much of a liability for me in next year's midterm elections. And I better get out ahead of this and separate myself from the Trump mess as soon as I can. So that that is a, a very significant event that has already occurred. Now yesterday, your humble host was returning from New York. Uh, I took a long weekend for Mother's Day and Kathy and I were joined by our step, my stepson, her son, and uh, uh, members of family on both sides. We had a great time. And uh, I, I feel fortunate that on Virgin America, which did a lousy job of <laughs> handling our flight yesterday, there were delays, they didn't tell us about it. But anyway, that's my, my problem. The uh, airplane was equipped with uh, satellite TV. So I was able to watch Fox, MSNBC, and CNN flipping back and forth as they shifted from the Russian intelligence leak of last week to the breaking news, and it actually was breaking news for a change, of the uh, alleged letter uh, or memo that was uh, drafted by Comey and leaked to the New York Times. So I, I just made a few notes. Uh, for example, for the first time, I witnessed Greta Van Susteren's new show on MSNBC. It was dreadful. Uh, she opened the show by blowing a key fact, uh, the date of the Comey-Trump meeting, and one of her uh, NBC reporters had to politely correct her. Then she trotted out two really virulent <laughs> uh, right-wingers, in my opinion, uh, Bill Kristol, who is a Republican, to, and to his credit, he was one of the never-Trump people. He used his uh, media organ, the, the Weekly Standard, uh, to gather people of the Republican ilk who opposed Trump during the primary, and uh, I think most of them stayed on board through the general election. And then they trotted out Alan Dershowitz, who is a completely discredited attorney and law professor, who proceeded to uh, often muddy the waters by defending Mike Flynn and uh, the allegation from Sally Yates that he might have been subject to blackmail. And then they trotted out a Republican congressman from Texas, Blake Farenthold, to defend Trump. Uh, they did include some commentary, uh, a clip from Chuck Schumer. But the obvious tilt of MSNBC, which I have been calling MSDNC, to a much more pro-Trump uh, outlet is shocking. And one of the things, you know, on the, the crawl, the headlines that annoy you by uh, being fed across the screen at all times, well, one of the items in the crawl was uh, about a, an effort by MSDN, MSNBC sorry, to collect positive tweets about Donald Trump's accomplishments. And I don't get what they think they're doing. Uh, it, it's just bizarre that on a day of news where the impeachment of this president uh, comes more and more into play, that they'd be saying, hey, uh, what do you think he's accomplished? Uh, say something nice to Trump and send your tweet here. It, it was just schizophrenic. And my other big complaint, uh, I first need to explain what B-roll is for people who don't know. When you watch TV... Uh, and the director of the show thinks that you're about to get bored just sitting there watching talking heads, they bring up file footage. It's called B-roll. 
and the B-roll shows the people that they're talking about. And yesterday, I, I didn't actually count, but I estimate that in one hour on MSNBC, they showed the same damn clip clip of Jim Comey walking across a room at the White House to shake hands with Trump. Trump whispers something in his ear. Then uh, Comey disengages, moves over and shakes the vice president's hand and then walks back across the room. They showed it over and over and over again. And it's just like, come on. Can't you do better than that? I mean, Comey's been FBI director for three years. He was a a top Justice Department official under Bush. And you don't have more file footage on this guy? It it was really annoying. So uh, the coverage really, I think, helps shape the attitudes that are going on. And I think it also exposes uh, that we are awash in leaks Trump has a legitimate complaint about that because he's being blindsided and broadsided on a daily basis uh, by leaks that uh, he is not expecting and can't control. And in an amazing display of self-pity, the Donald went to talk to graduates at the Coast Guard Academy today. Now, keep in mind that the Trump budget blueprint calls for huge cuts to the Coast Guard, which is one of those 17 intelligence agencies that uh, is, is supposed to keep us safe. And the Coast Guard actually does something. I mean, they guard our sea lanes. They intercept a lot of drug traffic and many other uh, nefarious people on the high seas who are intending to get to our shores. And for Trump to claim, you know, that the immigration issue is so important and that he wants to build a wall to stop drugs and other things from coming uh, over the southern border is really pretty preposterous when he turns around and proposes big budget cuts over there at the Coast Guard. Anyway... Uh, he, he was trying to pump up these graduates and saying that uh, you'll find that things are not always fair. You have to put your head down and fight. And then, of course, he couldn't resist talking about himself, which he always does. Look at the way I've been treated lately, he said, especially by the media. No politician in history, and I say this with great surety, has been treated worse or more unfairly. Aww. <laughs> now, uh, the question that arises here, and I pointed out the exact language attributed to Trump in the leaked information published by the New York Times, does that amount to obstruction of justice? And I would say that on a legal basis, because he said, I hope you'll do this, uh, I hope you'll find a way to do it, it wasn't a command or even a request. And so it's hard for a U.S. attorney to file obstruction of justice charges, in my opinion, based on the exchange that we have been uh, uh, told about. But in the bigger picture, impeachment does not rely on the technical issues of the criminal justice process. And obstruction of justice is an impeachable offense based on how it was used against Nixon and, to some extent, Uh, You know, Bill Clinton's perjury about Monica Lewinsky was an obstruction of justice. That is, I believe, one of the counts that was uh, forwarded by the House of Representatives to his Senate trial in Bill Clinton's case. And I would submit that Barack Obama and his long-running attorney general, Eric Holder, were guilty of obstruction of justice at the impeachable level related to the failure to investigate and prosecute war crimes for Guantanamo and the invasion of Iraq, and also the failure to investigate and pursue criminal prosecutions of Wall Street criminals. And so the statutes of of obstruction are pretty broadly written, and one uh, clause says that it is a crime if someone corruptly obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding. So it's fair to say that Trump did have the legal authority to fire Comey. I have some issues about that. I thought there were more protections written into the law that set the 10-year term for the FBI director. But it's uh, less clear and more likely that uh, he is vulnerable to impeachment charges based on obstruction. 
Here's commentary from Noah Feldman, professor of constitutional law at Harvard. Let's be clear. It's the impeachable offense of obstruction. It's probably not the criminal version of that act. With the evidence now available, now he's stretching it, as I pointed out, it's extremely unlikely that an ordinary prosecutor could convict Trump. But one of the items that I referenced earlier that's overlooked by the corporate media's uh, wall-to-wall coverage of the Comey memo starting yesterday afternoon is that the uh, New York Times story first reports that Trump talked to Comey about prosecuting and jailing journalists who publish classified information. And Trevor Tim, who writes uh, op-eds for The Guardian and is the head of the Freedom of the Press Foundation, notes today that the Washington Post reported multiple times that part of the reason Trump fired Comey, that he was incensed that the FBI wasn't being more aggressive in investigating leaks coming out of his administration. And apparently, says Tim, Trump was even insisting at one point that the FBI needed to go after leaks about non-classified information, which isn't a crime by anyone's standards. So this is truly chilling. Obama cracked down on whistleblowers. He did prosecute alleged violations by James Risen and James Rosen, Risen of the New York Times, Rosen of Fox News. And I support both of those journalists in, uh, uh, you know, uh, over the uh, efforts to prosecute them. So I, I think Trevor Tim makes an important point. I have linked to his column in the show file for today's podcast, and I hope you'll take a look. He closes his column by saying the Times reported there were multiple Comey memos detailing every interaction he had with Trump before he was fired, including some that were classified. One has to wonder how many of those during the long-ago Obama years called for Ed Snowden to be prosecuted and uh, (laughs) that they're now hoping there's another Snowden somewhere in the FBI or the Justice Department. Also, I want to note relative to press freedom and these issues that there's a lengthy and important investigative piece published the other day at The Intercept, and it's written by Ryan Devereaux and Trevor Aronson. Trevor recently was on our program talking about his own blockbuster investigative series about the FBI and the frame-up of domestic terrorism cases that was published at The Intercept. If you haven't read it, it's still right there on the home page in a, 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 a big box of its own. But this new report shows how the FBI used a fake journalist who was shooting video and interviewing people related to the Cliven Bundy occupation uh, in Nevada uh, back in uh, in 2013. And they go into detail uh, about how this guy who's... Uh, his name is Charles Johnson, and uh, he claimed to have worked for Longbow Productions of Nashville, Tennessee. That appears to be an FBI front, and he used uh, this role as a journalist uh, to basically set up the Bundys and get them to spill uh, incriminating information to him, which he would then turn over to the FBI. There's much more to the story in the lengthy investigative report at The Intercept, and I encourage you to check that out. The ongoing coverage of the Trump intelligence sharing with the Russian ambassador and foreign minister last week was dominating the news, and as I was leaving JFK Airport yesterday on the monitors, I saw Trump in a brief news appearance, a a press conference appearance, with the uh, strongman leader of Turkey, Recep Erdogan. And uh, Erdogan came to Washington uh, to enjoy Trump's warm embrace. And Trump didn't criticize him for the ongoing human rights violations in Turkey. But he really, uh, uh, you know, just said no to the requests that Erdogan made, one, to uh, disengage American support from the uh, Kurdish forces in Syria, uh, because uh, that's Erdogan's agenda. And Trump basically listened and just said no. Uh, that's what we're told. He also demanded that the United States extradite uh, Fetchula Gulen, the American-based uh, cleric who Erdogan blames for the attempted coup last summer. And uh, Trump uh, basically just waved that off. But after the meeting, and this got buried in the mainstream media reporting, 
Uh, a group of presidential bodyguards of the Turkish uh, dictator were caught on video punching and kicking protesters outside the Turkish ambassador's residence in Washington. And uh, video footage uh, has confirmed this. There are pictures that uh, are available online of these Turkish uh, security officers kicking protesters who are already down on the ground and uh, putting another female protester into a headlock. It appears that somewhere that uh, between six and a dozen uh, American protesters were uh, roughed up. Some of them uh, sustained some injuries in this uh, altercation with uh, Erdogan's uh, security goons. The other story that got buried, uh, and it does appear to be uh, incompletely sourced, is one that is very important to me, and it relates to Seth Rich. Seth Rich was the young staffer of the Democratic National Committee who was killed last summer in an event that clearly was not a robbery, even though the police continue to investigate it as such. An investigator named Rod Wheeler, who uh, it's important to note is also a Fox News contributor on uh, criminal cases, uh, Wheeler was interviewed by the Fox television station in Washington. And he was asked, you have sources at the FBI saying that there's information that could link Seth Rich to the release of the DNC documents to WikiLeaks. Wheeler responds in the Fox News clip, absolutely, and that's confirmed. So Fox, claiming that it had another source as well inside the government, is claiming that more than 40,000 emails were transferred from the DNC via Seth Rich to WikiLeaks. Now, this is not further corroborated, but it is consistent with my beliefs and the representations of the NSA whistleblowers I've interviewed, like Bill Binney, that this was an insider leak and not a Russian hack. And this is critical to the underpinnings of this whole cavalcade of fact-free assertions and reporting and uh, uh, conspiracy theories that we have been fed for a, a long time now. And I'm using an article from BuzzFeed that covers this story, and to their discredit, their headline reads, The private detective who ignited a Clinton conspiracy theory says he was misquoted. Now, if this is true, that Seth Rich is the one who actually transferred the DNC server contents to WikiLeaks, that's not a conspiracy theory. What it does is undermine the long-running, fact-free conspiracy theory of Russia's responsibility for these actions. And so I find it curious when the term conspiracy theory is used here. Now, it's also important to report that Seth Rich's family is rejecting these reports. They have uh, put at arm's length uh, this investigator, Wheeler. And uh, so it is murky at this point. And it's gotten lost in, in the uh, firestorm, the hailstorm, whatever storm we're experiencing right now over the Comey report. But I think it is extremely important, and we will continue to follow it here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast. Every day I like to pause for a second and thank the people who support my work with your subscriptions to the PBC Podcast. People like Jason Spitzer, Joe Carson, Carl Howard, and Jerry Frescia, who is a, sub a subscriber, checked in a couple of days ago lamenting the timing of my uh, little vacation break. Jerry is an expat who lives in northern Italy near Lake Como and is uh, an avid listener. Jerry, I appreciate your note. And uh, I also thank you for your support. If you're not a subscriber, why don't you help out? Because as time goes on, some people drop their subscriptions for various reasons. And I need your help to keep this going. So come on over to PeterBCollins.com. Click on the menu button, pull it down, click on Become a Subscriber. That takes you to the sign-up page, and you can make a choice about the level of support that's comfortable for you. There's a new report that nearly two-thirds of 91,000 American service members who were separated from the military for alleged misconduct in a recent four-year period had been diagnosed with either post-traumatic stress, a traumatic brain injury, or another condition that can lead to misconduct. And so this could be a really nefarious pattern of people who are suffering from the ill effects of combat who then get just you know, throttled out of the military and in some cases are prevented re uh, from receiving care from the Department of Veterans Affairs.
And in my new in-depth interview, which I'm releasing to subscribers today, with Peter Van Buren, we talk about his new powerful novel called Hooper's War. And Peter Van Buren, who you may recall served in the State Department, spent a year in Iraq, tells me in chilling terms about his own experiences and what it has cost him in terms of his, uh, his mental health. And in the book, he identifies the concept of moral injury, the impact of war, not only on combatants. Here's an excerpt from my in-depth interview with Peter Van Buren about his new novel, Hooper's War. Peter, to what extent is Hooper's War your own therapy for moral injury? One hundred percent, from start to, to finish. When I got home from Iraq, um, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I was not a combatant. I didn't pull. A, I didn't carry a weapon. I didn't shoot anybody. Um, but I came home with this this overwhelming sense of all the good that I failed to do in my time there and my inability to have stopped a lot of bad things from happening there. And I found myself a lot more interested in vodka than I did in, in my family. I went to the family doctor and the family doctor said, oh, it sounds like that Vietnam helicopter thing. Um, you know, where uh, we know from the movies, right? You hear the loud helicopter noise and you dive under the table or something like that. And I found myself on a journey to try to understand what was happening to me. And the more I talked to people who had been exposed to war of all ages, of civilians and soldiers, the more I realized we were all saying the very same things. Something broke inside me. Um, souls are just not that big of a place that we can absorb all of this and, and expect nothing to, to come of it. And that what I was trying to do, which was to put things off a little bit uh, with, in my case, alcohol, opioids are a very popular uh, choice. Um, suicide is sort of the natural extension for many people and we with, with this now 20 veteran suicides a day yeah. um, in the United States all of this has to come together at some point there has to be a datum point that ties this together then I started finding out that of the 20 suicides a day uh, among veterans over half of those are by people who are over 50 years old Meaning that what's driving them to suicide is not Iraq or Afghanistan for the most part. It's events that happened decades ago in some cases. Sure, sure, sure. Every suicide is, is different. Every suicide is unique. But at some point, the totality of information and evidence suggests there's a bigger picture that deserves a bigger picture answer. And the answer became, to me, understanding this concept of, of moral injury and starting to look back on how does one come home. Peter Van Buren's new novel, Hooper's War, is uh, now published. It was just released yesterday, and it's available at Amazon and other outlets. While I was in New York, where Peter Van Buren lives, we got together for a couple of hours at a coffee shop, and uh, I really enjoyed getting to know him a little better he is a remarkable guy and a very fine American. Now to that story that's been lingering for a week about uh, Trump's visit in the Oval Office with the two Sergeys, Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, and Kislyak, uh, who is the American ambassador or the Russian ambassador to Washington. That's the right way to put it. And uh, what is really humorous about this now is that we have the he said, he said uh, exchange that's been occurring. Somebody leaked information about that meeting to the Washington Post. And Trump believes it's somebody in his administration because there are only a handful of people in the meeting. And I've seen all sorts of speculation about who may have leaked uh, exactly what Trump told them about the ban on laptop computers because the Islamic State has developed some new way of blowing up computers. And, of course, the sensitivity about it is the source of the intelligence. We'll get to that in just a second. But I haven't heard any spe any speculation about whether the leak to the Washington Post 
came from the Russian ambassador or foreign minister. I think <laughs> if they're trying to create division and uh, you know promote uh, chaos and uncertainty in the Trump administration, uh, they certainly have the motive to do it. At any rate, we now have Vladimir Putin himself offering to settle this once and for all by providing his so-called record of the meeting that occurred last week. Now, we don't believe this is a uh, an electronic uh, audio recording. It's probably notes that were taken by some of the Russians who were there. And you may know that Trump banned any American reporters or photographers from entering the room for the photo op and only allowed Russian photographers and journalists into the Oval Office, which may have made it vulnerable to the dropping of some sort of a bug. <laughs> And based on what Trump has told us, it may not be the only bug in the Oval Office. Now, this compounds problems because Trump is on his way to his first overseas trip, including a stop on Friday in Israel. And based on another anonymous leak, we are told by the New York Times that Israel is said to be the source of the secret intelligence that Trump uh, blathered to the Russians. And it's amazing because the National Security Advisor, General McMaster, went to the media yesterday and said, look, and this is a, a remarkable boast, Trump didn't even know the source of the intelligence, so he couldn't have told the Russians that it was Israel that gave it to us. But others have said uh, pretty clearly that the information he did share was enough for the Russians to deduce where the information came from. And to put out the fire in advance of his visit, we're told that there was a phone call, we're not told who initiated it, between Trump and uh, Benjamin Netanyahu yesterday uh, to talk about that matter. The other crisis that is swirling in Washington, but so far has not had a big impact in the United States, is the malware case, which is called Wanna Cry. And uh, because I've run pretty long here today, I'm going to keep this part a little short. But fundamentally... As Bill Binney, who I referenced earlier, the former technical director at the NSA, has told me repeatedly, this vulnerability that allowed the malware to be distributed is the fault of the NSA. Number one, the NSA has failed to report to software makers, including Microsoft, the so-called zero-day vulnerabilities. Zero day is the first day of release of software. The NSA grabs a hold of it, looks for the vulnerabilities, and rather than notify Microsoft or other software producers about their vulnerabilities, they exploit them. They create malware that they can use to hack into it, either in the United States or elsewhere. And it was their collection of malware tools that was stolen last year and has created now a crisis worldwide with hundreds of thousands of computers that have been locked down demanding ransom in Bitcoin from an unknown provocateur. Now, this is uh, being blamed on North Korea. Uh, that could be true, but it also could be almost anybody else. And the people at Shadow Brokers who tried to sell these hacking tools basically gave them away in April. And we're told that one of their other uh, hacking or malware tools is called, um, let's see, Double Pulsar, and it has infected over 400,000 computers worldwide already. So the bottom line here is that the NSA is ultimately responsible for the WannaCry malware that is circulating the globe, and I believe they're just trying to divert attention by blaming North Korea. And I want to recommend a good analytical piece by Sam Biddle at The Intercept. I'm linking to that in the show file for today's podcast. Thanks for joining me for my news and comment podcast. It's available free every day, including on YouTube. I hope you'll share it far and wide. I'm your humble host, Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until again happy trails to you keep smiling